morning. Good morning. What a beautiful sound, the winds of the spirit through tiny vocal cords. <laughs> Please join me in our call to worship. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He knows his own and we know him. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. Let us listen now to the voice of our shepherd. Reading from Hebrew 
through scripture is Psalm 23, one of the Old Testament passages that paints a picture of the care provided by the good shepherd. So listen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Loving God, Good Shepherd, we pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen us to be devoted to the teachings of your word, that through it we may hear your voice and follow you all the days of our lives, here and now, now and always. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from the 10th chapter of John, verses 11 to 18, where we find Jesus identifying him himself as the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his, the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Our final reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 24. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are in from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should love, believe in the name of the Son of God Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Newport Presbyterian Church is nestled in a neighborhood in Bellevue, Washington. And once you duck under the overpass of Interstate 405 and turn off the bucolic Coal Creek Parkway, if you travel along a tree-lined street dotted with lovely homes, streets lead, lead up the hill to the right to the mountain in neighborhoods with names given to them by their developers, in the latter half of the 20th century. And one of those roads, identified with a rough wooden sign, leads instead into the church property. The road winds to the left and the church appears on the right. The building has been built in keeping with the northwest 
surroundings. It's dark wood blending into the landscape of towering trees. The driveway leads to a series of parking lots that bring a small island of trees and shrubs, in the middle of which is a rough wooden cross and a small lectern, surrounded by five or six log benches arranged in a circle, where one can imagine a Sunday school class or an adult Bible study gathered on a warm, sunny day. As habit dictates, the car in which we drove nestled into a parking space in the portion of the parking lot we always parked. For my wife, Jan, and I attending that church prior to COVID-19 happened once or twice a year. And for the other occupants of the car, my eldest daughter and her husband and our two granddaughters, a little bit more than that, but not much, I'm afraid to say. All the more reason that the bedtime stories my wife tells the girls have lessons embedded in them that point to the way a child of God should grow. As my son-in-law put the car in park and shut down the battery-driven ride, we noticed something different about the parking spaces that were next to us. In the first stood a porta potty and one of those receptacles specially designed for cigarette butts. And at the end of the other two parking spaces, there were wooden stakes driven into the ground bearing signs. In bold black letters on white backgrounds, they read, reserved for our overnight guests, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I have a question, announced the six-year-old in the back seat, who is rarely without a question. <laughs> Why is there a porta potty in the church parking lot? Her mother answered, it's for the people who must sleep in their cars because they have no place to live. The church lets them park there overnight in safety. Accustomed to seeing colonies of dome tents nestled under overpasses and in the side yards of churches throughout the Seattle area, our little one didn't need any further explanation. And after church, on the way to a brunch near the iconic Pike Street Market, we would pass by several encampments. But for the moment, as we walked up the slight hill and entered the church, behind a young Asian woman being pushed in a wheelchair by her mother, it was enough to conclude the impromptu lesson on living as Jesus commands by noting that their church was doing what it can to live love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Those words from the first letter of John are part of what many consider to be a commentary on the Gospel of John. They come as the author attempts to teach the twin themes of the Gospel. Belief, that is, trust in the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the commandment to love one another as Christ has loved us. And the living out of that trust or belief and that love commanded by Jesus is rooted in in the example of Jesus himself. The love Jesus lived and commanded is more than mere words. It issues in action. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another, writes the author of John. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Life reveals the children of God, says one notable Christian. In other words, in words similar to those found in the letter to James, John writes, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? <clears throat> A few years ago, I was typing those very words into my scaled up so I can barely read it Sunday morning script when there was a knock on the church door. There stood a familiar figure whose life has taken at least two steps backward for every half step he makes forward. And I listened to the latest chapter in his tale of woe that included a severe medical condition and co-pays for every visit for treatment, 
and medication prescribed for all the side effects of the treatment. And with the words of First John across the room flashing on the computer, and the balance being in my pastor's discretionary fund, I was confronted with that question that's in our text this morning. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and refuses to help? The only possible choice was to embrace the answer John provides. Little children, let us love not in word or in speech, but in truth and in action. So from the funds my congregation set aside for such moments, my visitor left provided with a tank full of gas to get him to the next treatment and enough dollars to pay the co-pays. Back out in Washington, <clears throat> one Saturday evening, our visit took us back into my brother, son-in-law's car. He drove us down from the heights of Cougar Mountain to an indoor soccer field on the valley floor. It was a chance for my wife and I to do what a lot of people get to do more frequently, and that's enjoy seeing a grandchild play a sport with their friends. And I must say that being indoors with a snack bar and beverages available was a much better deal than sitting on a frigid aluminum bleacher a few days later watching the younger granddaughter and some four or five and six-year-olds as they chase the ball around at their last t-ball practice. <laughs> <clears throat> After watching our team win with my older granddaughter making a couple of great saves as a goalie, one of the other fathers who'd been standing next to me the whole time began to talk to me about his church. Apparently, everyone had been clued in that Katie's father is a minister. <laughs> Dan is a successful lawyer who was serving on the pulpit nominating committee of his Lutheran church in Seattle. He and his wife had begun attending that church while they were students at the university. And they stayed involved even after they moved a half an hour out of the city. He lamented the declining attendance in their church and the lack of participation by his generation. He spoke of the difficulty they were having attracting a candidate to relocate to a place with such a high cost of living. And he told of conversations the Lutheran congregation had begun to have with the Methodist church nearby about finding a way to work together, possibly merging and putting one of the buildings to work as a resource for the community and a shelter for the homeless. Now what I thought had, was going to be an intrusion on my vacation became another uplifting moment. To hear about congregations that are willing to go beyond, that's the way we've always done it, that are thinking outside the box, that are looking to meet the needs of neighbors beyond their own membership roles was a gift. It was uplifting to hear of people who were being honest about their attempt to be the church in the midst of changing the times. And it was heartwarming because back here in Pennsylvania, I was serving out a church that was working its way into a new future, sharing a building with another congregation and discovering how to reach out to our new neighbors. When Dan spoke of meeting the needs of their neighbors, it was another reminder that there are people who have heard and are heeding the message to love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Writing in a recent edition of the Presbyterian Outlook, Roger Gensch calls the love the foundational fruit of the Spirit. And in these words for clarification, in our cultural context, we think, tend to think of love as an emotion, and thus may need to be reminded that love in the Bible is not so much something you feel as something you do. It is an action rather than a feeling, an action on behalf of another's well-being, sometimes regardless of how we feel. To put it another way, 
The love Jesus commanded and demonstrated and John writes about is a conscious, positive choice that seeks what is best for the other, whomever that other happens to be, friend or foe, an intimate or an enemy, someone special or the stranger you happen upon. Expressions of this kind of love occur around us and to us and through us all the time. Someone questions a hurtful Facebook post and researches the validity of it, discovers it turns out to be real fake news, and she warns others not to believe it or pass it on. A person doing their daily, daily steps in the mall notices a vacant, frightened look on a face at the intersection of two aisles and stops to offer assistance and stays until a caregiver comes looking for the sheep that has strayed. And an individual who once was living meal to meal with more than a few skipped along the way quietly places some soup cans and cornflakes on a table in the back of the church. The size and the scope of active love matters little because the impact will be large and lasting. Our Sunday sojourn in Seattle was nearing its end. And after brunch in a trendy spot a few doors away from the original Starbucks, we walked through the Pike Street Market. We stopped briefly as the girls and their grandmother taste tested some chocolate covered chucker cherries. We made our way past what seemed to be acres of cut flowers for sale and booths with vendors selling t-shirts and paintings and all manner of handmade crafts. We passed that open air seafood market where tourists line up to watch them toss the salmon back and forth before they put it on the scale and put it in a bag. And before we went out toward the street, we passed over a walkway and looked down on that famous gum wall, watching people taking selfies next to all this gum, <laughs> or making their own additions to the multicolored confectionery collection. And once on the street, we headed down to the waterfront, eventually taking a set of steep steps past the beautiful fountain, down, 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 until we were at the level of the sound and the piers. Our destination was near that Ferris wheel that is in all the pictures of the Seattle waterfront. And there, the National Park Service has an attraction called Wings Over Washington. Rising from the side of the pier is a building that looks like one of those Northwest wooden lodges you would expect to find in a national park. And after buying your ticket, you're escorted into a little room where a guy in a Smokey the Bear hat tells some funny stories about the region and the uh, First Nation peoples. And then with some safety instructions, you go into another room for a, a ride. You're sit seated in this theater, and you're told to take this three-point buckle and buckle in like you're in an airplane. The light's dim, and the knee wall in front of you is lowered. The floor drops out from under your feet, and a curved screen appears before you, and there's an eagle. And the next thing you know, you are flying behind the eagle, up and over the mountains, down across the Puget Sound and the San Juan Islands to the Harrow Strait where the orcas rise and jump and get splashed by the water. Over the endless tulip fields of the Skagit County, up and over the mountains, down through whitewater valleys just above kayakers, into the blasted side of Mount Helens about to erupt again. And then out to the Olympic National Park, along the Pacific, around through the Section Pass, and then you come back across Puget Sound into Elliott Bay, and you're back in Seattle. It's a thrilling ride for those who keep their eyes open. 
<laughs> and an adventure to endure to the delight of your grandchildren if you're a grandmother who's afraid of heights. <laughs> and while our eyes adjusted to being out in the open again, we made our way along the waterfront in the direction of the parking lot below the marketplace. And just past the Seattle Aquarium, there was a crosswalk leading under the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which has since been replaced by a tunnel dug deep underneath us. In the shadow of the viaduct are a dozen or more tents pitched. <clears throat> a multicolored patchwork of temporary housing that is for many all too permanent. Attempting to be polite and respectful, I tried not to stare. But something caught my eye. There in the midst of the homeless folk in their multi-layered, worn and weary donated outfits was a family dressed in their Eddie Bauer best, a mom and a dad and two kids. And in front of them was an array of paper rags with handles on them, the kind that the delis and the restaurants give you for your takeout meal or your leftovers. The woman was reaching into the bags and handing out sandwiches. The man was reaching down and breaking out water bottles from the case at his feet. And the kids were handing <coughs> out cookies and chips. The day ended as it began, with a teachable moment to help us all discover what love in action looks like. An act of kindness, an expression of love, a reminder of all the evidence of selfishness and self-indulgence that surrounded us, that there are people who see a need in a brother or sister and do something to help. Such sights call us to do whatever we can, whenever we can, wherever we are. So using John's favorite expression, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. Amen.
вот. disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is a time of welcome. We welcome this child of God into the family of faith, trusting the words of the Apostle Paul, who said, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and in all and through all. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show us that we belong to God. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love and peace, and justice. So let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate the sacrament today. <clears throat> On behalf of the session, I present Autumn Rose Schimmelfenny, child of Lindsay and Alex Schimmelfenny, to receive the baptism, sacrament of baptism. That's you. <laughs> Do you desire that Autumn be baptized? I do. Yeah. Will you, by your prayers and witness, help Autumn to grow into the full stature of Christ? And do you, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Autumn by word and deed? God gives a new life, strengthens us to resist evil, and nurtures us in love. Through this covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. Please affirm your willingness to undertake the responsibility of teaching your little one to love and serve God by answering these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? I do. Do you claim God's covenant promises on your child's behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? I do. And let us pray. God our Father, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. As we baptize with water, baptize us with your Holy Spirit so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. O God, who has called us all from death to life, we give ourselves to you. And with the church through all ages, we thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. called us by name and pledged to each of us your faithful love. We pray for Autumn. Watch over her, guide her as she grows in faith, 
Give her understanding and a quick concern for neighbors. Help her to be true disciple of Jesus Christ, who himself was baptized and is now our risen Lord, God of grace, Father of us all. We pray also for Lindsay and Alex. Help them to know you, to love with your love, and to teach your truth, and to tell the story of Jesus to their daughter so that your word might be heard in their home. Holy God, remind us of the promises given in our own baptism and renew our trust in you. Make us strong to obey your will and to serve you with joy for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome to God's family, little one. Live as a child of light and let your light shine before others. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. <laughs> Thank you. And you can show your approval for this. <laughs> Concerns listed here in the bulletin. Are there any to add to them? If not, let us join our hearts in prayer. Shepherding God, in a dangerous world, let us hear your voice and come and go through your gate. We pray for the whole church that we may be devoted to your word and to universal fellowship, being generous to all who have need. We pray for the earth, for green pastures and still waters, that we may restore them to the goodness and purity they had at the time you created them. We pray for the people of the world, their nations and leaders, that your wisdom and peace may govern all so that no one will fear. We pray for all those in need, for those in want, for those who are ill and those who are dying, that we may be the banquet that, your, that you set before them as we anoint them and feed them and comfort them in your name. We pray for ourselves, our families, and those we love. Especially, we pray for Lori and Gary, for Bob and Linda, Alberta, Betty and Chris, our dear friend Margaret, Sue and Marge, Florence and Gretchen and Les, Wade, Bob and Carol, Neil, Dory, Ali, Carol, Yolanda, Andrea, Mary Beth, and all those loved ones who are isolated at home or in nursing homes. We pray that no one may live in fear, that all may dwell in your presence. Blessed are you, great shepherd, who through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit give us goodness and mercy, leads us down right paths and restores our souls. And now hear us as we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we give thanks that God has prepared a table for us, and that our cups overflow. So now, 
giving thanks for all that you have given to the church and continue to do to support its work. Let us hear the words of our offertory. Thank you. 